listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. And Michael, it's been an eventful morning here on March 25th, the league meeting in Orlando, the breakfast for the coaches. We've gotten a lot of news and notes that's come out of that, some interesting comments. How are we doing today? We can get into all of it, this podcast. What what would... What was in that coffee down there? Jesus, God, almighty, <laughs> man. I mean, yeah, well, it Bailey's is, we've gone from full, yeah, maybe, I hope it was. You know, we've gone from full free agency into full, you know, draft lying coverage now. And this is, this is when we're in week seven of the offseason. This is when it gets interesting, right? It's March 25th. We've got, what, four weeks to go. Collect mm-hmm. the lies. Collect the evaluations these mock drafts will be completely wrong. Uh, everything won't go as, as, as status quo. And we'll focus mostly on this position that everybody seems to get wrong. You know, I was working on a column today for, the, for VEASAN online. I think I'll post it tomorrow. And since 2000, there have been 69 quarterbacks drafted in the first round. And that counts the three that were picked last year, Femi. And so that's 66 guys. And of that 66... 37 of them you would declare less than expectation, right? That would be your RG3s, your, you know, your Jameis Winstons. They might play in the league, but they were clearly not what every Marcus Mariota, not what anybody thought they would become. So, you know, to me, it's like you're, you're looking at a 56% fail rate. And yet we're, we're talking about all these guys as being can't miss. And there's got to be something in this whole process that I think people are missing. And people grade the production, right? That's what we see in the mocks. They grade the production, the incomplete passes, the completed passes, right? Mm -hmm. But what I think in terms of understanding the position and understanding what goes into the position, I think it requires what you don't see more than what you're actually seeing. Yeah, I mean, no better case than that than Josh Allen. We all remember that draft process. Everybody was killing Josh Allen. Says, yeah. This guy is under 50, 60% completion. He played at Wyoming. He gets a bad schedule. Like, how is this guy ever going to be a good NFL quarterback? And now he's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. And if you grade that production, maybe you were a little bit lower on Josh Allen. If you were more so projecting the tools, the traits, the makeup of the person, maybe you were a little bit higher on Josh Allen, as were the Buffalo Bills, and they'd be able to come up with gold having him as their quarterback. But it, it's really interesting, though. And the, the NFL draft is one month from today, by the way. April 25th in the Motor City will be the first round of the NFL draft. And I thought the, the comments that came out of the draft that were so interesting to me as it pertains to these quarterbacks has to be from Michigan head coach Jim Harbaugh. Uh, I mean, he was asked about J.J. McCarthy once again earlier this process. He said J.J. McCarthy is the best quarterback in all of college football. He's the best quarterback in his draft. Today, he says, quote, I think he's the best quarterback in the draft, says a killer comes out when adversity hits. Is that what you're hearing? And that what, is that what you see as well when you watch the tape of J.J. McCarthy? Like, where do you stand on this guy? I and mean, it doesn't have to be a complete evaluation of him. We can get into a little bit of that a little bit later on throughout this process. But does that match up? Is Harbaugh, what he says, match up with what you're kind of hearing and seeing when you watch him on film? Well, let's start by what I said to begin the pod, right? If it matched up with the production on the tape, he would be the first overall pick in the draft, right? I mean, if the production matched Jim's rhetoric, it would be easy. It's not. Now, here's where you have to be really careful. Jim Harbaugh is really good at evaluating quarterbacks. He is really good at this. When he started his career in Oakland with us, you know, he went through all the quarterbacks in that draft, and he wanted to draft Tony Romo. That was his favorite quarterback in that draft. Didn't go work Romo out, didn't spend time with Romo, just watched the tape, studied the tape. But I think Jim has this unique ability to understand what he, what people don't see in the position and what's needed in the position. So whatever you think of McCarthy, I don't think Harbaugh's overselling this for the kid. I think this is sincere. How do I know that? Well, when I went back to speak to the University of Michigan this summer – You know, I was in their building for an entire day. I got to hear a lot of stories. And the one story that resonated the most with me as I prepared for the college season was how there was a debate internally between the the organization, the coaches, scout, everybody, or not scouts, but but, I mean the personnel people at Mm -hmm. Michigan, between Cade McNamara 
and J.J. McCarthy. And Harbaugh felt all along that it was McCarthy and he was by far the best player. He didn't think it was close. But he let it play out. Remember he did those first four games where they rotated? He let it play out. And then by playing it out, the decision became everybody's decision, not him dictating a decision. Pretty smart, right? Yeah. Which is what Jim's kind of good at doing. He's good at being a, building a team. So knowing that as a backdrop, knowing what he said then about the player, he, he's not selling the player. This is P.T. Barnum here. He, this is what I think he truly believes. And so for you as an executive, you know this. And if you respect him and his ability to evaluate like I do, then you've got to really kneel, kneel, dr- drill down on this. You've got to use J.J. McCarthy as a learning tool. If you put on his third down tape, it's pretty good. If you put on some other tape, he misses easy throws. He has an awkward time. You know, they don't let him throw the ball very much. And so you're wondering, like, where does he see this greatness? Where is he seeing it? You know, it's like we used to, you know, Al Davis would only – he didn't want any more than 25 plays on a highlight reel. That was too – if it got to more than too much, oh, this is too much. No, we can't have this. This Cut this down. <laughs> so the scouts were selling Napoleon Harris to no end, okay? They loved Napoleon Harris, you know, and, and, and so they were making tapes in, the, in what I called their lab because their lab was always – you never knew what the 40 times were until they got done processing it, right? And so it, you were work, basically working with like three different departments. You had the, 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 the scouts, you had the coaches, and then you had some of the pro guys like me and – Jack Barheight and, and, and all other guys in there, you know, we're kind of watching the tape too, you know, in case he asked us questions. And so, you know, and so they, Napoleon Harris was, to me, the most non-instinctive linebacker I'd ever seen in my life. Like, I saw no value in him at all. I, I mean, I knew he was size speed. I knew he could run, but I didn't see what the scouts were seeing. And they finally put together a tape, and it showed – it showed – Napoleon Harris making these incredible plays, which I still really didn't see in the tape. Like I felt like it was more scheme driven than it was him making the play. But, and you know, I could still see him. I finally see it. There it is. He's junior. Say, we going to get him, you know? And so like you just keep looking. And if your mind's programmed to see what you think you hear, you have to see then that can be a distortion. So I think you have to separate it. Look, I think Jim's very clear, and you have to take Jim's evaluation seriously. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really interesting because like that's the takeaway that a lot of people said. Oh, he's just shilling for his guy. That's his guy that he went to with Michigan. But you're saying that that's not what he would do. And you mentioned executives should take notice. They've reached out to Jim Harbaugh. Uh, J.P. Finley over uh, at NBC Sports in, in Washington, D.C. tweeted, said Harbaugh says, quote, absolutely no surprise that J.J. McCarthy had an excellent pro day and is climbing up draft board, says league-wide that general managers have reached out to him, quote, raving about McCarthy. So the general managers, the decision makers who've actually met McCarthy, they love him. I mean, teams are, I guess, now warming up to the tape, or maybe they were already there, and we're just kind of playing catch-up about how they feel about J.J. McCarthy. But this doesn't sound like this is just some one-off of Harbaugh just gassing up his guy. This sounds like the league also is saying, hey, this is a legitimate quarterback who we are really interested in and has the potential to have that upside. Because that's one thing you talked about in our last podcast. You have to project going forward. It can't just be what we saw in college. It has to also project going forward. And maybe McCarthy will be, at least from the, the outside perspective, a better pro than he was a college player. Yeah, and, and, and so it also, you know, nobody follows up with the question, right? Like, what, do, what, what does he need to be in? What offense does he be in? Mm-hmm. I think that's the missing ingredient. You know, when I go back and look at my mistake on Josh Allen, you know, I am from the Bill Walsh school of foot alignment, quickness in his feet, quickness in his mind, and dead point accuracy. Well, Josh Allen was just a brute strength, a bull in a china shop with very limited accuracy. You know, he could cut the wind in Wyoming, but God knows where the ball was going to go. And I was brought up to believe that was really never going to change. And I believed it. You know, I'm not blaming this on my education. I'm blaming this on what I what I've learned through my career. And so I was wrong. And because he's six feet five, he's 250 pounds. He's not perfect, but he does some incredible things. I think the hardest thing for people to understand at home watching quarterback play 
is are they in a progression read scheme, which they're very few, right? You know, everybody talks about reading one, two, and three, when in reality, it's really the schemes now have become high-low schemes, right? We're going to throw the ball here to there, and we're running, if not. And so it's no longer you've got to separate the progression read players, which are few, from the we're throwing the ball here with our foot, with our foot movement, and here's where we want the ball to go. And I think that's something where like a Bo Nix shines brightly because he can play with rhythm, he can play with timing, and within a system like that has been what, what Sean Payton runs or the West Coast, he could shine in that. And so you have to understand that. You know, it, nobody talks about the, the foundational system within. You know, Drake May, as I said in the last podcast, is big, he's strong, he's got a great arm. But can he actually do all those things? You know, what kind of scheme does he need to run? Where would he be most effective? He's got the intangibles and the traits to believe he's going to improve. But what's the level of improvement? Is it Josh Allen level of improvement? Right? Or is he mm-hmm. just lack so much anticipation he, the ball won't ever leave his hand? I mean, look, Jalen Hurts, the ball wouldn't leave his hand. He got benched in a, in a, in a playoff game because he, wouldn't, he couldn't throw the ball effectively. Yeah, so... There, there is a, you, you've got to add some development of growth here. I think McCarthy and Knicks are guys that have that foot movement tied to their arm that are going to make them move up. It's interesting. And, and on Thursday's pod, we should grade these guys because I still have the grading system that you sent me last year. We can maybe put some grades on these guys after you've watched more of them play because I think this is a quarterback class that's really interesting. We'll have more pro days coming up. Jaden Daniels, that pro day. We're going to finally get Jaden Daniels' weight. That, that'll be interesting at the On a scale, yeah. We'll, we'll see if he we'll put some dumbbells in the pockets. We'll see what happens there at LSU. And we'll have Drake May and Michael Penix on the 28th as well. So uh, we'll be able to get some of these QB evaluations. Last thing, though, you mentioned Napoleon Harris. I don't know if you knew this. He's now a member of the Illinois Senate from the 15th District. So he's doing good for good. him. He's a politician. Great, great kid. Yeah, it seems great like Great kid. It. Was a tremendous kid. He helped us get Randy Moss to, to Oakland. Oh, of course, we screwed that up, too. But at least he helped us. There you go. Helped us, and now he's trying to help out people in the state of Illinois. All right, we'll be on the other side to talk about some of the more news and notes that we've seen from the league meeting down in Orlando. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, we'll get back to the notes from the NFL League meeting down in Orlando. But we did have a transaction, a big one that happened over the weekend, and that's the Kansas City Chiefs sending their star corner, Legereus Sneed, to the Tennessee Titans for a 2025 third-round pick and a swap of seventh-round picks in this year's draft. Sneed then follows that up with a four-year, $76 million contract. $55 $55 million guaranteed with Tennessee. So Kansas City, it, they franchise tagged him. They didn't really get the big haul that I was expecting here. I thought that maybe we could get like a two. I don't. A one never really sell like, it felt like it was in question, but maybe a second-round pick, but they only get a third-round pick for next season, which, as we've said, a third-rounder ne- next year is almost like a fourth-rounder this year. And Snead goes ahead and cashes in with a bit, pretty big contract to help out that Tennessee Titans secondary that vastly needed a, a lot of help there. And they have $27 million of cap room this year because that contract came off. So the question is, did they miss the window to sign a blue-chip player? Did they miss the window to have a deal done, right? And so they tied up all this cap room to then end up with the same thing they would have gotten, essentially, had they just let him become a compensatory player, mm-hmm. right? If they just put him in the compensatory pool – they would have gotten a three next year because he would have gotten this contract or perhaps even more on the open market, which then would have given them a, a, higher, a higher rate on a return. That, that I think, is the, t- the question, is who did they lose? You know, who did they lose? What was the opportunity cost here of, of what happened, right? Like, the opportunity was we we're going to get a good pick. We wanted to protect our rights for the player because if you're putting the tag on them, you're saying – Unless we get the deal we want, he's more valuable to us than that third in 2025. That's a compensatory Mm -hmm. third. That's what you're saying, right? And so the opportunity cost becomes we just got the same thing, but we lost the window. We lost an opportunity to sign 
Christian Wilkins, let's say, right? Because, yeah. you know, you could have taken that cap number and put it into Christian Wilkins. And now you got Wilkins and Chris Jones playing next to each other. Oh, my. Jeez. <laughs> right? Or we could have taken it and put it into somebody else, right? To me, that's kind of how I was. I view this. And so, and now, we're not done yet. And, and this team is very good at handling player acquisition and player movement. So I'm not saying they're saying they made a drastic mistake, but they've got $27 million of cap room. What are they going to do with it? Are they going to reinvest it in their own players? Right? I mean, that's something to consider too. But I think at the end of the day, they've got some older guys, Kelsey and, you know, that offensive line. They've got to repair that as well. So it'll be interesting to see. I think there's still another part to this that has yet to be revealed. But the opportunity cost initially, Femi, seems like they would have been better off just letting them go to the market. Do you think that they maybe, I guess, overvalued the corner market? Because I'm looking at some of the highest paid cornerback contracts. Right now, Jair Alexander has the highest paid one, $21 million. Denzel Ward right after, after that, then Jalen Ramsey at 20 Then it's Legereus Need at 19.8. But we haven't really seen these cornerback contracts go up at the rate as we've seen some of the wide receiver contracts or some of these other positions. And corner, it's not like it's viewed like running back. It's viewed as a pretty valuable position amongst the league. We see corners go in the first round all the time in the draft. Is there a reason why that the corner is not going, the value of those contracts are not kind of meeting what we've seen with some of those other guys like the edge rushers, the defensive tackles, the receivers, et cetera? Well, it's hard unless you've got complete shutdown corners. The corner needs the rush. Right, the corner needs the rush as much as anybody. So it, it, he, it's a dependent position. On you know, there's very few guys you just line up and say, "Well, the ball's not going here." Right? It's like that. You know, the Houston Bass Shed is his name. The kid that played against A&M last night. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jamal defensive Shedd. player for Houston. I mean, he can guard it. Yeah, I mean, he can guard anybody. I mean, Buzz Williams came out and said this guy can guard anybody in the NBA. He can guard anybody in college. That's a shutdown guy. I mean, they're, they're, again, this is an over. Not every corner is a shutdown corner. And there's like what I call breakfast corners and dinner corners, the ones who win early in the route, ones who can win later in the route. And the guy who's a shutdown, the Woodson, you know, those guys, the Dion's, those guys that just dominated and you don't want to throw the ball anywhere near them. Uh, Revis, you know, you don't want to throw the yeah. ball anywhere near him. So I think to me, you know, that that's where you're not seeing that number jump because there is still liability would attach to the player. Yeah. No, it's I, I, we'll see what happens in the draft because I don't think the corners are really highly touted in this year's draft. Feels like more of an offensive draft, but yeah, I mean the the cornerback market. I mean Trayvon Diggs, we saw him sign last year. He's under twenty million as well for the Dallas Cowboys. So these guys that have been coming up for these fresh deals haven't been getting like the twenty two, twenty three, twenty four million type of uh, dollars that the wide receivers have been getting. Let's get over back to Orlando though with the league meeting. Mike McDaniel, Dolphins head coach, confirmed the interest between the Dolphins and free agent wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. went as far as to say that the Dolphins made an offer to Odell and the conversations are, quote, ongoing. Uh, <laughs> that, to me, sounds like maybe Odell doesn't, isn't satisfied with the offer or maybe that he thought he could get more. Like, uh, well, like what is, what he's is not on, satisfied yeah, with the ongoing offer. Ongoing is an interesting way to phrase that. How do you take – I mean, if you're – Odell saying, I made $17 million last year. Like, I'm not taking a pay cut, even though he didn't have a good year and hasn't okay. had one. I mean, Odell's like the like a guy who put out an album, you know, and has had one good album out, and he keeps living off of it, you know? And so eventually you go from playing stadiums to playing dinner theaters. I mean, at some point, when's somebody going to wake up and say, okay, wait a minute, he ain't shifting the balance of power? I, I don't get it. I really don't. And you, you're, you're also taking on some liability. I mean, if Miami probably offered them a very economic, friendly deal for their team. Mm -hmm. But Miami's issues are in the offensive line. Have they improved that line? I find that hard to believe. You know, now Miami still hasn't gotten done the, the Tua contract, which I kind of expected would happen. I would think it would. Right now, Miami only has about $10 million of cap room with 65 players. You know, so we'll see how that pans out. I expect it to get done, which would free up some cap room, but it doesn't free up cash. It's going to be expensive. And one thing the Miami Dolphins have done over the years with with uh, Stephen Ross as their owner is they spend cash. They spend money. Yeah, the, the Miami offensive line, they've lost guys. Isaiah Wynn, they brought him back there to play at left guard, but they lost Kyle Smith. Obviously, Robert Hunt went over to Carolina on the big free agent deal, $100 million oh. to go play for the Carolina well, Panthers. You, when you look at uh, you know when you look at the over the cap 
he, you know, he puts together those graphs of contract value and free agencies and, you know, he kind of plots it along and it's a really good, you know, obviously I, I use it. I'm, I pay to use it because you get the numbers and you can look at the contracts and he does a really good job, but he does these quadrants of, you know, like here's where you are, you know, what, here's what's happened in free agency, just strictly from a monetary basis, you know, mm -hmm. You know, the top right is a lot of reshuffling. I don't, it doesn't mean you've done a good job, but just you, you shuffle paper. The top left is adding players and not, and not losing too much. That's kind of where you want to be, right? So in that quadrant are Washington, Atlanta, Tennessee, Arizona, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, the Jets. That, and the Jets are at the lower end of that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, in the, and then the other quadrant is Dallas. the relatively minor changes. That's the bottom left, right? That's the bottom left. Minor changes: the Rams, the Patriots, the Packers, the Steelers. You know they, and and then the bottom right is a lot of changes. And Miami's at the at, at, in that at the top of that list, and so is Dallas, yeah. right? And so is Dallas. Dallas, the Chargers, the Ravens, Seattle, Buffalo, Cincinnati, and Miami are in that quadrant. And all of them, when you go through your gain loss list that I send you every week. That there's significant losses on each of those teams. Now, you don't factor in the draft. You're not factoring in some of the young players. Like for Baltimore, they've got a bunch of young players that they believe can be the replacement for these older guys they lost. And if that's true, then this graft is completely irrelevant. But, mm -hmm. you know, it does tell you that, that these teams have to have really good young players because they've lost a lot. Yeah. No, I do want to ask you about the Cowboys in the next segment here because Jerry Jones had some interesting comments. Uh, I think he was on his luxury bus or whatever he's at when he was traveling down there to Orlando. But let's talk about Odo Beckham Jr.'s former team, the New York Giants, because their head coach, Brian Dayball, had some comments about Daniel Jones, said that, quote, he'll be the guy. He sat down with NFL's Tom Pelissero said, quote, you certainly want to have a better record than we had last year, so there's no stone unturned. That was his comment for why they've been kind of snooping around and sniffing around this quarterback market, bringing in Russell Wilson, meeting with J.J. McCarthy. But he drew the line saying, quote, excited to get Daniel back. When he gets back, he'll be the guy. Um, I mean, Dayball can say what he wants to say, but the actions also speak pretty loudly as well as you're bringing in Russell. Like, what, what was it just Russell Wilson wanted to meet him to have lunch? Like, like what was that for? And, you know, like, <laughs> it's like, what are we? Well, I mean, it's, it's lion season. I mean, if Day, I mean, Dayball's in a tough spot, right? I yeah. mean, if he kills Daniel Jones, he loses any chance he has. And if he, and if he says that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not. So he goes down and he pretends he's not really looking when, you know, Daniel Jones is 22, 36 and one as a career starter, has never averaged over seven yards per attempt, you know, has had one winning season in this time. And it wasn't because of him. So, like, he can't he can't say what I say on the pod because, mm -hmm. you know, the, then all of a sudden he's created a complete mess. But, you know, this is the bed they let they chosen. This is where they have to lay. And he's got to try to fend it off, but he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. To me, if I'm a Giant fan and he isn't looking, then he th then he's then he's negligent in what he's doing. Yep, get him out. Then of he's there. negligent. You know, going back to going back to JJ McCarthy. If, if Jim believes what he believes, right, and you're the GM of another team, you're you know, call him up and say, hey, look, you, you want just can I you willing to trade Herbert? If you got if you want McCarthy, you willing to trade Herbert? Wow. Ask him. Say, hey, look, you willing to – no, no, we're not going to – well, I mean, look, I got the fifth pick in the draft. You want it? You want it for Herbert? You can draft McCarthy right there. What do you think Jim would say? I, I think Jim would probably want to do it. I, I don't know if he'd want to do it because I think Herbert's really good. But, yeah. you know, put him on there, you know. I'm sure he would say I got to talk to everybody here, but ask him. I got the fifth pick in the draft. You want McCarthy? Well, the problem is that I'll hey, take Herbert. Hey, McCarthy might not be around for the fifth pick in the draft. I mean, it, it, Monty Austin for the fourth overall pick in Arizona. Maybe they're looking to move down. I know everyone's pegged them for Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, one of those wide receivers. But if they get an offer, if it's as aggressive as Minnesota potentially could be with their two first round picks, the ammunition that they've built up, uh, there's other teams like the Giants who have been snooping around on these quarterbacks. Maybe they move up just slightly there to get into that top four. And who knows? Maybe. It's the Denver Broncos. Sean Payton said, he asked if he was realistic that the Broncos could trade up. He said, it's realistic. So he might have to get yeah. into that top four if he wants to well, go I mean, ahead and get McCarthy. Well, look, one thing we know about Sean, 
If he thinks he can get the guy he wants, if he thinks he can get his Drew Brees, he could give a shit about next year's draft. He's going to pay whatever he's got to pay to get the player he wants. Yeah, because right now their starting quarterback as of today would be Jared Siddham. But we don't have to play today, so that doesn't really matter. We'll see what they do in these next months to go ahead and position themselves for the fall. All right, that does it for us on the DraftKings Network, but on the podcast side, we'll keep it rolling. More from the league meeting in Orlando next year on the GM Show. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. You mentioned how Dallas has lost a lot of players without really replenishing their roster right now here. The Cowboys have a big potential extension going for Dak Prescott that could get done to lower his cap number a little bit. CeeDee Lamb is eligible for a contract extension. Even Michael Parsons is eligible for a contract extension. Those are pretty big deals that they would have to get done. And and the Cowboys have been a little bit closer to the vest this offseason here, uh, Michael. It's just that it hasn't really been exciting for what they've been doing, but that's kind of typically what they do in free agency. And Jerry Jones was asked about this approach and said that, quote, that is really the gist of what we're about this year. We've got Dak. We want to get it done. I think we have been in a situation where we can get it done with less. So they're almost kind of conceding, hey, this is not going to be the roster that we did. And you talk about how they've been overachieving instead of underachieving. Well, can they overachieve next year if they're having to get it done with even fewer options and fewer blue chip players than they've had in years past? Yeah, I mean, look, they are in a difficult situation because Prescott right now counts $55.4 million on their cap, right? You know, Lawrence counts $20 million. C.D. Lamb counts $17 million. Zach Martin counts fifteen million. Trayvon Diggs counts sixteen million. Gallup counts thirteen million, and he's not even there. And so you start, you know, that, and all of a sudden you're, you you got you're, you're the Rams. You're the Rams, but you're not as talented as the Rams. You don't have Aaron Donald. You know, yeah, you got Makai Parsons, and he's a really good player. But Donald's different, right? You know, you don't have you don't have everything that the Rams had. So you're on the Rams program is what Jerry's saying. You gotta get, they're going to have to draft really well, which they can do. Tyler Smith's going to have to go play left tackle. Terrence Steele's going to have to play better at right tackle. You know, he's making $11 million. He's a cap hit of $11 million. So I think this is a transitional year for the Cowboys. I know DraftKings posted their number at 10 and a half. Mm-hmm. I'd bet the under if it went down to 10. I know there's some juice on the 10 and a half. I'd bet the under to 10 because I, I don't see it coming together. Because when you're this – void of depth and you're counting on certain players and the young players to really come in and contribute i think it's really challenging on the coach well i guess then from like the fan base standpoint because i'm in the fan base i root for this team obviously it's a team that i love there's things that they could do to get cap space to be active and acquire more players like why wasn't that done like is there a lack of because i i see it i'm like okay do they not believe in dak prescott like they can say that they believe in him but then get the contract done lower the cap number get cd done get parsons done and then maybe get some of these other guys in there to maybe try to go one last run because at the start of the offseason he says all in now his definition of all in is clearly different than what the fan base is, is but if you're really all in on this thing try to make a run at this with Dak Prescott as you're entering the final year of your head coach's contract that you say that you believe in but don't want to give him an extension so it feels like almost the Cowboys are like you said resetting things and kind of trying to dip their toe in the water for 2024 but are maybe eyeing 2025 more so than anything yeah well I I think to me you know everybody wants them to do that but you know Martin's at one you can't lower Martin's paragraph five number Lawrence is only at 10 million. You're not going to pick up that much cap room with Lawrence. Mm -hmm. You know, Brandon Cooks is at 8 million. You want more acceleration with Cooks? I mean, everything comes with a cost, right? It's easy for you to sit in Las Vegas and say, Jerry, go spend this money. And then, you know, you don't, then two years from now, you're complaining that Jerry doesn't have a winning team because he spent this money. There has to be a recalibration of the money spent. And I think what Jerry's saying to you as a fan, we're going to draft and play young players. We have a lot of good young players. We're going to develop those young players, and they're going to be good because we have superstars. We have Dak Prescott. We have Lawrence. We have Lamb. We have Parsons. We have soup. We'll, we'll get Diggs back. We have superstars that can help the other players become better. Whether you believe that or not, I don't know, right? Whether you believe as I do that some of what he thinks is the superstar may not be as good as they are. Right. Mm -hmm. I think Parsons is obviously I think he clearly is. I think Lamb is a superstar. 
you know, I think Prescott's a very good player, but they need another running back. They need other things around them. Yeah. You know, we know when Prescott throws it over 35 times, I mean, they need balance within their attack. Now, can they get a running back in the draft? Of course. Could they find it back in the fourth? Yeah, of course. Maybe it's Vaughn. I don't know. But I, I think you got to, what you're basically, Jerry's saying to his fan base is, trust me, I'll find players. I mean, they found players, but I don't know if we can trust what they've been doing over the last two plus decades now here since they haven't had the playoff success here. But here's here's some comments from Jerry Jones a few years ago, which I think is interesting given the approach that they're taking this year. He said, quote, the truth is most anything that I've ever been involved in that ended up being special, I overpaid for every time to the end. Any time I've tried to get a bargain, I got just that. It was a bargain in a lot of ways and not up to standard. Those are Jerry Jones' words right there. But I guess, like they said, maybe they're kind of trying to let the fan base know that this is a kind of recalibration year. This is a resetting year. And then we'll go from there later on in 2025. But, yeah, it's like you said, the win totals are up at DraftKings for all 32 teams, which is awesome, by the way. Shout out to our show sponsor, DraftKings. Cowboys one is at 10 and a half. I don't see how you see that 10.5 number and not think under based on what's happened so far this offseason. Maybe that's just too obvious, but like, I'm not saying the Cowboys are going to win six games next year, but it feels more 8-9, eight 9-8 nine, nine and eight than anything to me right now, at least where we sit after three straight 12-win seasons. All right, we have well, some— I mean, oh. l- l- before we leave this, before we leave this, when you look at, you know, there's two things. There's cap spending and then there's cash spending, right? Mm-hmm. If you look over from 2019 to 2023, the Cowboys are in the top 10 of spending cash. When you look at the last, you know, just last year only, if you look at what they did last year, they're in the top 10. I mean, they're always in the top 10 of cash spending, right? Mm -hmm. Chicago over the last five years has spent the least amount of money of any team in the league, okay? New England's second. If you look at the last four years, Atlanta and New England are the two least expending teams. If you last over the last three years, Atlanta, Chicago, and New England have been the least spending team. If you last over the last two years, it's Chicago, New England, and Atlanta. And then just last year, it was the Rams, New England, and Washington. So what you can see is, you know, the, the, the trend here is there are certain teams that just haven't spent money in five years. Chicago and New England being the leader, Atlanta being one of those teams as well. And then there's teams like Dallas that don't spend the most, but they still spend significant amount of money. Yeah, and they've been doing that. And then part of that is because they've drafted really well. So I guess maybe we should trust them to draft. Will McClay, good luck, man. Go, go, go find us some good players that are on the cheap here. Uh, there are some interesting players though still in the open market available, some of the best of the rest now that we've gone through Phase one, two, maybe even three of free agency. Justin Simmons, the safety from the Denver Broncos, he's still on the open market, as is Stephon Gilmore, played last year with the Cowboys, Jadavian Clowney, who there's been some rumblings about Clowney and the Jets. Nothing has gotten done as of right now. Quandre Diggs from Seattle, Xavier Howard from the Miami Dolphins, and then Tredavious White coming off of the significant injury with the Buffalo Bills. All of those guys are still on the market. Where are we at with those guys? And I guess, should we not really anticipate anything happening until we get further into the offseason? season, maybe even post-NFL draft. I mean, it would be perfect if Clowney signs with the Iffers because the New York Iffers, the Iffers, if they're healthy, could be really good. The Iffers are really good, right? I mean, the Iffers could be really good if they stay healthy, if if Rodgers stays healthy, if Mike Williams stays healthy, if Morgan Moses stays healthy, if your man Tra- Trayon Smith Tyron stays. Smith, the Iffers yeah. could be good. <laughs> Clowney would fit perfectly into the Iffers. But whether that happens or not, I don't know. But here's what I do know is the number. Beckham's not getting the number he wants or else he signs. Mm -hmm. Simmons clearly isn't getting the number he wants or he signs. And the Eagles said, we're not waiting around. We're going to sign Gardner Johnson, and we're not waiting for you, even though we know our our defense coordinator would rather have you than Gardner Johnson. But at that number, we don't want you, and we're not waiting. we got to fill the need. So these are veterans. All the what do these all these players have in common? They're veterans, right? Mm-hmm. And they're all and they're all waiting on a deal that isn't out there right now. And so why would I come in and have to be a part of OTA days and part of all this shenanigans when I'll just wait it out and sign it in in August? You know. Mm-hmm. So clearly, if Clowney thought he was now, I don't know how Clowney could pass the efforts physical. I don't know. Well, but Tyron Smith, you know, passed. maybe he can because he's had a lot, a lot of injuries. But you know, Smith passed, so the Ifers team doctor is is got you know he's wearing different glasses today. 
<laughs> take a look at that MRI. Maybe maybe they see something different. Maybe it's upside down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, those guys, like you said, Clowney. I mean, he signed last year in August for the Baltimore Ravens. Had probably his best season in his career. Nine and a half sacks. Was able to hit that incentive there in Week 18, which was a memorable moment uh, this past season. So I don't think Clowney, based on his history, is in any rush. The other guys, maybe we'll see something in May, June, or July. Like you mentioned, once we're past the spring stuff and teams have kind of broken for the summer, then right before they get back to training camp in uh, mid to late July. Because if, if you can get the same deal then, just go ahead and do that. Don't get involved with the uh, the OTAs and the mini camp stuff if you don't have to. Last thing here, we got a couple minutes left here in the pod. Uh, the NFL, this is interesting. They went ahead and banned the hip drop tackle. Uh, the competition committee was unanimous on it. Now, this was something that, that we felt was going to happen. Players around the league are, are anti-hip drop tackle being banned. I think it's going to be a disaster to try to officiate this thing. It sounds like there's going to be more fines yeah. than flags from the reporting. But uh, what do you make of this hip drop tackle now being being taken out of the game here. I think they're putting the refs in an impossible situation, to be quite honest. Right, I do too. And I think you're going to see more calls. I don't know if you're going to see fines. I think you're going to see more calls and we're going to be frustrated with the call because it isn't, is it or isn't it? Should the calls be reviewed? They're not going to be reviewed, right? So I, I don't know if this was unanimous. I talked to a couple teams that were not in favor of this, but, you know, they spin it. And, you know, of course, Rich McKay's not involved with football anymore, and, and he got it passed. So that's mm. a good thing, you know. And so they'll move on. But thank God he's not, you know, he's just devoting his time to other Arthur Blank projects. So, uh, look, I, I think this is another layer that they have to make decisions on it in split seconds that can only cause us to have con – look, player safety is really important. I don't disagree with that. However, this – grading this talent and judging this tackle correctly is problematic. I think Richard McKay's maybe moved on to more of the Home Depot side of things than, than the Atlanta Falcons side. Yeah, so. right, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to make sure we get those home improvements ready to go. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's going to be an impossible thing. We'll see the, the big rule change that I think we'll find out maybe later on this week, the new kickoff rule that's been proposed. It's kind of similar to the XFL kickoff rule. Uh, yeah, we I should know that by Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll fig figure that out by Thursday. I think that could be interesting. I mean, the kickoff last year and, and years past has kind of just become a formality, just given like where it's, it's been the ball's been placed and all that stuff. So if we get some more exciting plays with kickoffs, maybe that adds to the game. You know, add, add a little bit. I, I still want the onside kick rule thing to be changed. The Eagles' proposal of the 4th and 20 or 4th and 15, I think would be really interesting, but that's never passing for some reason. They can't get it through. The competition committee doesn't seem to be really interested in that rule change. But we will get to all of the rest of the news and notes on Thursday's pod. We'll also break down more of the quarterback prospects here for our producer, Elliot Bowman, and the entire crew behind the glass. Subscribe, rate, and review as always. Michael, I'll see you on Thursday, man.